This is a presentation of the University of Wisconsin Parkside. Okay, so I hope, I hope everyone can be able to see my slides. I know this is not the best screen. Uh, so I always like to start off uh, a lot of my, my talk with, with this quote, and it's, and it's a quote by Charles Darwin. He, he, he had a very wonderful way of putting things. And what, this particular quote of his about, about fossils has really stuck with me, and that is, uh, there's nothing like geology, and in this case, paleontology, at that time, fossil hunters really were, to, were geologists, they looked at them as rocks. The pleasure, uh, and this is funny, I should have had you know, how old the quote is, the pleasure of the first day's carpet shooting cannot be compared to finding a fine group of fossil hunters which tell their story of former times with an almost living tongue. And that last bit there, tell their tale of former times with an almost living tongue. And this is, this is, this is one of the things about fossils that, are, uh, that I find so compelling, is just how much we can actually learn from studying fossils. Now, a lot of times when, when, when people think about fossils, we usually think of, you know, all the skeletons in museums or maybe shells or something like that. Um, there are many different kinds of fossils. And these are the only records we have of really anything that's happened in the past as far as life is concerned. The fossils are our, our only record. Um, this is just a nice little time scale here, trying to give you an idea. Um, we have our earliest life, uh, our earliest fossils showing up about, um, uh, or complex life from about half a billion years ago. And um, our popular di dinosaurs in the Mesozoic era here. And then, of course, this last little bit tacked on at the end, there's uh, the age of mammals with humans kicking up the tiniest little inconsistent sliver that uh, time period. But we have things like, uh, of course, the body fossils, um, shells, teeth, and uh, even uh, plants, plants like fossils, leaves, fossil leaves, uh, but also other things, indirect types of fossils, footprints or trackways, uh, burrows that an organ and animal might have uh, dug into the ground, fossil poop called coprolites. Uh, what they ate, and even other other kinds of things, bite marks, which I'll also talk about, and um, even changes in chemical alterations. One of the ways we know when when life maybe started to have an effect on the Earth are changes to uh, to the chemical composition of certain rocks. So the life is incredibly diverse. And current estimates go that about 99.99% of all things that have ever lived on Earth, all species that have ever lived on Earth, are now extinct. And so there's an incredible diversity of life out there that we wouldn't know about without the fossil record. And there are, there are many things that are, are familiar. There are some big mammals and things that, you know, sharks, uh, types of birds. But there are also some really weird things, things that only hint at some of the areas of how different life was in the past. And we get examples of, of how weird life can get, where we have things like the sauropod dinosaurs, the largest living land animals ever, in excess of 100 tons and over 100 feet long. These are the push the limits of what, of what we think how big a land living uh, animal can get. So, why? Why care? What is so important about this? Well, one of the things is we need to put all this, we need to put our fossils into context. And one thing to keep in mind is that um, the continents have not always been in their current position. They have moved over time, and they have carried their. Uh, their, their organisms, both fossil and living, with them, like a giant rat. So, for example, during the Mesozoic era, the uh, continents were all one large unit and, uh, called Pangaea, and then they 
slowly split apart. And this caused many, many changes that had profound impacts on the history of life. Another thing, climate has changed drastically over time. In fact, what we consider like a normal climate today is extremely unusual as far as um, we look back in the past. In fact, the Earth has normally been much, much warmer than it is currently within, um, within the, uh, human evolution and human experience. In fact, if you look at the, the current distribution of um, of uh, biomes, of, of the different types of plants that exist under different climate regimes, uh, and we compare that to the Jurassic period, one, one of the things you notice is that it's much warmer towards the pole. In fact, for much of Earth's history, there were no polar ice caps. There was no permanent ice at the pole. And this has uh, 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 a very important implication for the, the types of climate that plants and animals be exposed to. All right. So I want you to keep that in mind. Those are, those are very important things to do. Why this might, why the uh, fossils are important. Now, a lot of uh, popular, there are a lot of popular uh, uh, showings of uh, dinosaurs and other, and, uh, especially dinosaurs in, in movies and other media. And, you know, among the, the the more recent and, and, and one of the greatest popularizers of um, uh, dinosaurs and, and, and dinosaurs as living animals and how they may behave would be like Jurassic Park. And they, they show certain images of dinosaurs behaving in certain ways, chasing down lawyers and eating them, <laughs> uh, jumping on things, and all that. But, uh, even outside of movies, a lot of TV shows now depict uh, depict extinct organisms and treat and uh, treat them like characters, like they are living, breathing animals. And there are many examples uh, from the uh, TV shows. Uh, this is not canceled, by the way. Uh, and, and even for kids, they talk a lot. They talk a lot about, about what prehistoric animals were like when they were alive. But the, the question is, how much of this, these, these, all these things, and you see something running down the street or gobbling a lawyer, how much of that behavior, how much of this information do we really know? In other words, how, how do you decide, right, paleontologists especially, make inferences about the biology of extinct organisms. How do we really know these things? Well, step one. One of the major things we do is we establish a frame of reference. And this is absolutely, this is absolutely critical because without some sort of context in which to help you understand your fossil organism, you don't know where to begin. So, one of the, one of the ways we, we usually do this is by creating a family tree based on our best understanding of its evolutionary relationships, who it's most closely related to. Right? And we can use this to help reconstruct what sort of structures or behaviors were most likely in our extinct So, let's again using dinosaurs as an example. We can construct our tree. So here's Tyrannosaurus rex. Tyrannosaurus rex is a dinosaur, and its closest, its closest living relative happens to be birds, shown here by a emu. So let's build our tree here. So these guys together are part of a group known as the theropods. These are, these are mainly the meat-eating dinosaurs. Then, let's see, we have horned dinosaurs and the triceratops. So those form a group. These are, these are the dinosaurs proper. So a dinosaur is actually a name for a specific group of organisms that all have a common ancestor. Let's go back a little further. Dinosaurs and pterosaurs, the flying reptiles, are also related. They share a common ancestor. These are called the 
the Ornithodirion, which basically translates to uh, bird necks. Then we have our, cro our crocodiles and alligators. Together with dinosaurs, birds, and pterosaurs, they form a group that shares a common ancestor. These are referred to as the archosaurs, the ruling reptiles. So here, this is our family tree, and we can, we can use this to uh, uh, ask questions. So let's do a really, let's do an easy one. Okay? The dinosaurs lay eggs. Seems like a relatively straightforward and easy question, right? But uh, if we had never found a dinosaur egg, we wouldn't know. One thing we can do, so we look at our living groups, crocodiles and birds. So crocodiles lay eggs, right? Birds <coughs> lay eggs. I had some for breakfast this morning. Um, so we can use it by inference. We go back to our common ancestor, so we would we assume that the common ancestor would have this same trait. And we go back up our tree to our extinct relative, which have the dinosaurs here. And based on this inference, we should we can we can say, oh yes, dinosaurs laid eggs. Because the, the, two, rel the two relatives on either side our two living relatives also demonstrated the same, uh, the, had the same property, the same trait. Now this will be this will be true until proven otherwise, until we actually find physical evidence for that otherwise. But this is one, this is one very simple example. Alright, now the next step. So we've set up our family tree where we can use it to help make comparisons. So what do we do next? We actually look at the fossils themselves. There is a treasure trove of information stored in the fossils that we are only just starting to scratch the surface about how we can use this information. And we do this by comparing our fossils with what we know about living organisms. So there's, there's always a comparison going on here. This is very important. So kind of thing, what kind of things can you figure out? One of the first questions we ask is like, well, what did they eat? So we can look at things like teeth. So herbivores have particular kinds of teeth for chopping or grinding tough plant material. Meat eaters, predators, are going to have sharp, cutting teeth. They're going to have large, terrible claws for piercing and holding their prey. Okay. Now, this only works so much because there are, because with this method, there's always a chance that you may run into an animal or an organism that has a, a morphology that looks like something you've never, never seen before. We have a hard time uh, comparing it to, to living representatives. So some of these guys at the bottom here, we're still not really sure about uh, what they ate. They have very strange teeth. Another thing we can use, here's our coprolites, our fossil poop, filled with things like if it's a predator, they'll have bone pieces in it. If, the, if, it, were a, if it were a plant eater, we could actually find plant pieces in it. Even though we cannot always co um, connect that directly to the poop maker, the pooper, if you will, um, <laughs> we, this does give us a really good idea about what was being eaten. Then there's also appearance. What did, what did they look like? What did dinosaurs, what did other fossil organisms look like? So um, we can look at certain traits, uh, crests and horns and frills and all sorts of other structures. And living organisms, these are, these are a lot of these have a behavioral relationship, either to uh, that to let uh, members of the same species identify each other, or for members of the same species to compete against each other, like with horns, compete over mates, or food, things like that. And they, they, they have been brightly colored, as we see in, in living organisms. 
But one of, the best, one of the greatest things we have, and this is direct evidence of appearance, is skin. We have fossilized skin and skin impressions. So we can tell what they, if you actually walked up to this animal and put your hand on it, this is what you would feel. This is what it looks like. So we know that a lot of the plant-eating dinosaurs, they had this kind of heavily scaled skin. And these were arranged in, 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 in scales of different sizes and different, uh, different orientations, um, different arrangements. <coughs> but then there are the median dinosaurs. Many of them had feathers. We have direct fossil evidence of feathers preserved on the bodies. And these are not just things that flew. We have feathers on dinosaurs, on, on the predatory dinosaurs, on median dinosaurs. And these feathers are very ancient. So within the median dinosaurs, within the theropods, feathers, feathers, uh, the first feathers were not flight feathers. They were insulation. They have the appearance of insula uh, insulatory uh, feathers. And they occur way, way down in the family tree of the Nidhi dinosaurs. In fact, things like Tyrannosaurus rex, even though the adults may not have been feathered, the young may have, the baby T. rex. Because one of T. rex's earliest relatives on his family tree, this thing called Dimon, we have evidence of fossil feathers. Um, and it was only later where, fo where, fe where feathers were uh, evolved to be used for, for flight. So they had they had other functions before. Other functions before they were um, they were used by birds. Plus, so birds inherited feathers from their relatives. And even better, this is this is the best actually is that we can now say for some dinosaurs what color they were. And how do we do this? Because in some um, fossil feathers, the preservation is so good, it's down to, a, it's down to the cellular and microscopic level. And the cells that give feathers their color, called melanosome, are just, uh, the, one, the ones that give different colors have different shapes. The cells themselves have different shapes. And their shapes are preserved in the fossils. And so we can look at the distribution of these, the, the shapes left over. The bacteria are gone, but the shapes, the little spaces left behind are still there. And we can look, we can determine what the colors of the feather was. So for example, we can tell uh, if it was dark, if it was a black or very dark colored feather, or if it was white or light. We can also tell whether it was red, uh, a very brownish red color. And so we can take this information, and I have, I have a, a, a median dinosaur here that this banded pattern now we know to have existed because we can measure this, these distribution of these little, these, these little spaces on the fossil feathers. So we know that they have this black-white banding coloration. And more recent, more recent fossil birds, like this giant penguin from several million years ago, we can tell that it actually had a reddish brownish color on its chest as opposed to the normal black and white that we All right, other really cool things. Fossil bone preserves all sorts of information. One of the, the, the really cool types of information that's been um, that has been preserved recently is, or that's been, that's been uh, discovered recently, is that the size of the space, so inside of bone tissue, there are these little holes where the bone cells live. And remember, so just like all living organisms, a cell has the complete DNA sequence to build that individual, to build that species, that animal, that plant. And actually, the, side, the, the cells can be bigger if they have a big genome, if they have a lot of DNA. And, the, and since bone is hard, 
the space that these cells sat in would have fit the size of the cell. And so we can actually measure the size of the cell and, and the genome of living animals, and we can extrapolate that relationship back to extinct animals. So in other words, we have a way to estimate the size of the genome for a dinosaur. The size of the genome, the amount of DNA it takes to make a dinosaur. And we can, we can tell by looking at this, by looking at, at, at the dinosaur family tree, that on the path to birds, and the evolutionary lineage leading to birds, that the genome got smaller, it shrunk. They got rid of a bunch of stuff they didn't need. So we can even get into, we can even get into some genomics with fossils. Other things, diseases. Diseases preserve very well if they affect bones. And this is just one example. Who, who's been to Chicago and seen Sue at the Field Museum? This is Sue. This is her lower jaw. And it had a bunch of holes in it. At first they thought that was from um, cannibalism. But when they compared it to other, uh, to, the, uh, to bone diseases for birds, they found a striking similarity with this type of, of bacterial disease that leaves these lesions that basically eats holes away in the bones of the mouth. And they match these up to those found in Sioux. And, they can say, and we, we can say fairly confidently now that, that Sioux suffered from this disease that we now count, that we do find in birds these days. So we can look at diseases and, and uh, uh, pathologies, things that happen when a dinosaur breaks its leg or uh, has an indoor <coughs> toenail. We can see these and we can observe these things. We can study the diseases in extinct animals. Reproduction, making new babies, is another thing we look at. So we do have dinosaur eggs. We can tell a, a lot about how dinosaurs reproduce from their eggs. But did you know we can tell the sex of a dinosaur. There is a special type of bone that is laid down in the bones of female birds when they are about to lay eggs. That's used as a source of calcium to make the eggshell. Um, it's called medullary bone. And it's been found now in uh, a couple species of dinosaurs including Tyrannosaurus rex, as well as some of the du uh, ductile dinosaurs, which means we can tell whether a dinosaur was male or female. If this bone is, if this bone is present, it's a female, and it was about to lay eggs. Again, I'll let that sit. All right? We can tell the sex of the dinosaur. Not only that, by studying the rings in the bone. So if you look, if you look at the, the if you look at the, 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 the bone, um, and this this goes for, for a lot of animals, even us, you can see growth rings, like the rings of a tree, that tell us about its age, how old it was. And we can plot this information and figure out how fast something grew. So here's our line here. This is a growth curve for Tyrannosaurus rex. And what this means is that Tyrannosaurus rex, this steep line right in the center here, Tyrannosaurus rex grew really, really fast. It grew really fast. So it's um, teen the te teenage Tyrannosaurus rex had a more massive growth spurt than any 13-year-old you've ever met. Okay. Um, and, and that medullary bone, that medullary bone shows up in our teenage T-Rexes. So we know that they started, they, they were able to reproduce before they were fully grown. So they, they, they were able to reproduce very early in their life. So we can tell about their growth. And in fact, we can tell for different groups of dinosaurs, on average, that they grew very fast. So, for these are all, these, this is um, 
their growth, their, the backbone growth rates for different groups for different groups of animals, right? So birds are this red line. Okay, so the, the higher up you go on a y-axis here, the higher up, the higher the growth rate. And then this, the along this axis, the greater the mass, so the bigger they got. So there's a, there are birds. There are crocodiles. Crocodiles have a much lower metabolism. They grow much more slowly. And then, here are dinosaurs. Dinosaurs grew about, as, especially the biggest dinosaurs, grew as fast or faster than birds. Okay? Because they, that's how they got so big, is they had, they, they didn't live really long. They grew really fast. Um, smaller dinosaurs didn't grow as fast, but in general, so there's always a question about, you know, were dinosaurs hot, a hot, a hot blooded or full blooded or anything like that? Um, dinosaurs, dinosaurs had metabolism that seemed to be um, anywhere from a rather fast reptile metabolism to uh, something that approaches um, many types of birds. Other things. So here's some tracks. So uh, tracks are really neat because not only can you not only can you observe how fast something was moving. There's also some really great track sites that that record the tracks of hundreds, if not thousands, of individuals um, over a period of uh, a day or two. Um, and you can see, like, you can see this, there's this really great track site where you have a bunch of, of um, there's, there's this, there's this, there's a, 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 some plant eater and it's plodding along, and all of a sudden, you see, you see the, the footprints start to get further and further and further apart. And then out of nowhere, because the, the rocks are part of the rocks are covered, you see the footprints from a predatory dinosaur coming from the side. You can tell it. See the beginning of a chase, an interaction between predator and prey, preserved in the fossil footprints. But this one right here, this is one of my favorite. You know, a lot, of, and, and this for for dinosaur paleontologists like me, anytime, anytime we see a picture with a T. Rex or or a Velociraptor with its hands down like this, it makes us cringe because they couldn't do that. They held their palms in like this. They couldn't rotate their hands like we can. They were fixed towards the center like this. And we now have fossils that show because that an impression of a, of a median dinosaur that sat down in the mud to rest for a second shows the impression of its hands sitting on the sides like this, not flat on the ground. We know the posture of the hands now from these fossils. We could only guess before by looking at the way the bones went together, but this gives us confirmation. Other things, bite marks. I mentioned these. These are cool. This tells you that something at least tried something else. Now, I'm going to show you some interesting work uh, that actually that just came out last week. I was a uh, uh, as the lead author on this, um, we have uh, there's a fossil site that I work at down in Texas that is done in Dallas called the Arlington Archosaur Site. In fact, you can see Dallas Cowboys Stadium from our dig site. It's smack dab in the middle of Dallas Fort Worth. Um, we have a new giant crocodile preserved there, and we also have turtles and dinosaurs. But the really neat thing about this. And what the paper that we just wrote about is uh, detailed is the fact that we have bite marks on the turtles and the dinosaur bones that were made by the crocodile from the same site. So we know that this guy ate dinosaurs and turtles. And so this is an artist's depiction that we had that we had created specifically showing our new species of crocodile eating a turtle. All right, so these are examples of some tooth marks. But even better, we know how, we know how it ate them. And that this type of behavior is ancient in crocodiles. 
Crocodiles and alligators, this type of behavior, this um, ambush behavior is quite, is, quite, is quite ancient. So they would sit in the water, and this is what we think our croc would do, sit in the water, and would lunge out and grab prey and pull them in. And for big, for big prey, they do what's called a death roll. They actually twist the limbs off by rotating their bodies so they can eat more easily. And we have the marks on the dinosaur bone to show that, that the croc, that's how the croc ate the dinosaur. It twisted their limbs off. Then, for the turtles, the turtles, it ate the, it ate the turtles using what's called, uh, what's been described as a nutcracker type behavior, where it turns the turtle on its side and cracks it along the, the parts of the shell that are the weakest, just like this living alligator is doing here. So we can tell a lot about the behavior of the, of the animal from, just from these bite marks and where they're found on the fossil. So just to give you an idea, this is not the only giant crop. There are many fossil giant crops, which are showing us that dinosaurs were not always top predators in their ecosystem. In fact, there were dinosaurs may have regularly been eaten by giant crocodiles. All right, this is one of the coolest parts. This is the part where we get a lot of technology. We bring in, we bring in all sorts of computers and things. And this is what this is some of the most cutting edge stuff. Alright? We do this to help to help us better reconstruct what the uh, what they look like as living animals, the soft tissues, things that don't fossilize, as well as how these how their bodies truly function, they move. So cat scan. So um, the the, all, the newest range, well I mean the, the newest 10, 10 year old, 15 year old range has been cat scanning fossils, putting them into a medical a medical CT scanner and running them through it. And the nice thing is because fossil bone is different density than the rock around it. So this allows us to look inside the fossils without even having to destroy them or touch them. And what we do with that is we can act, for example, we now can study dinosaur brains, okay? By looking at the space inside the skull where the brain is. This is often very difficult to see, but now with the CAT scans, we can make a computer model and study the brain of extinct animals to find out what their senses were like. So, for example, here's a brain. The parts of the brain of animals are very similar. The same parts tend to do the same, have the same function. So, all the way from lizards up to us, the parts of the brain have the same function. We can study them. For example, if we have our, our, our sense of smell up in the front. We have our, uh, our sense of sight and uh, balance towards the back. We have the seat of consciousness, our intelligence towards the, this orange part in the front. And then other, other parts related to our, our balance and our ability to move around um, is, all, is, is this pink part here. But we can, we can study these, and the relative size tells us the relative importance of that part of the brain, of its function to the living animal. So, we can figure out how smart dinosaurs were, relatively. Um, so on our, on our, our, our chart here, what we're doing, this is called the encephalization quotient. Basically, this is the size of the brain, its volume, divided by the body size, by the size of the, the, the animals. And so the lower down here you are, the dumber, the dumber you are, okay? And then higher up, of course, the smarter you are. So crops. Crocs are not bright. I think you know, that is a fairly well established fact. Birds, birds actually have a very wide range of intelligence. Some birds rival babies and toddlers in terms of, the, in terms of their uh, in, uh, intellectual development. 
but definitely higher than, than many types of than many mammals. Um, and so dinosaurs are all the yellow guys off to the left. So here are the raptor dinosaurs. And their intelligence is, well, definitely greater than, than crocodiles and alligators. But um, also, is, they're also uh, smarter, at least in this relative term, than, uh, than, than certain birds. And so we can see kind of a hint of, uh, they, may not, they may not have been like the raptors in Jurassic Park, with the opening doors and, I don't know, solving Rubik's cubes and stuff. Um, I don't think they could do that. But we do get a relative gauge of their intelligence. All the other dinosaurs, all the other dinosaurs, down in the bag of bricks. See, they're all down in the, in the crop range uh, of uh, intelligence. Other things. We can use computer models to make virtual dinosaur skeletons and study how they move. It's very hard to take bones, these big fossil bones, and try and manipulate them and figure out how they work and how they move. But we have computers now. We can, we can build very realistic models to figure out how dinosaurs move. This is, this is one of the ways, what, if you've heard about uh, research that showed, oh, well, a T-Rex could run this fast and that fast. Um, it's based on this kind of modeling research. And that's shown at the bottom here, looking at what's the optimal, the optimal arrangement of the leg bones and how they could best move and what kind of speed that would be. So we can study a lot with the computers now to look at how they actually move and they can create, sim they can create simulations of dinosaur walking um, and whether or not certain types of, of locomotion were uh, where uh, they were able to do it or not. Um, here, this, this, this is one of the last uh, important things I want to show you. Um, this just came out, I think, earlier this week. This was, um, this was public. So, one of, one, of my, one of my greatest interests is what, the, what, the, what life was like back in the past. If you actually were able to take a time machine back, step out into a forest and see what all the animals and plants and things were doing. And also there's, there's certain things you take for granted, like the sound of insect noise. What, what was around? What did the dinosaurs hear? And we actually, until now, until this research came out, we didn't know yet if there were any insects that made music made noise until this paper just came out and there's a really well preserved uh, it's called a bush cricket it's the type of cave did and living the living members of this group rub their wings together to make noise and there are certain marks there are certain these little ridges on the wings that when they rub against it that's what produces the noise and but, uh, there's a really, really well-preserved fo fossil of, the, of this fossil cave did that they, it's so well-preserved they can reconstruct what it sounded like if, as, um, based on models from living, uh, living cave did. They built a computer model to see what, what, this, what this kid, the fossil would sound like if it actually tried to, to make it noise. So, the authors created, uh, created a sound file of what it would actually sound like. So, if everybody just, please just quiet down for a minute so you can hear this. This is what the dinosaurs would have heard. So I just want to recap. So 
The title of my talk is Why Study Fossils? Besides it being cool, um, it's definitely I'm not in it for the money. Um, <laughs> we can learn so many things. Remember, this is our only window into what life of the past is like. So, we can look at the ecology of organisms, what they ate, how fast they grew, um, how they interacted with each other, how they ate things. Um, how they reproduce, how fast they grew, uh, what diseases they may have uh, fell victim to, um, and even how they moved, how fast they could run, what they were capable of. And then in a larger perspective, the evolution, evolutionary pattern, and this is, you know, gets close to home now, that we can look at what happens to the, the, the evolution of organisms in response to major changes in climate. And we can use what we learn from those studies to, to help better understand what we're, in, what we're in store for as our own climate changes. What kind of things might we expect as we go to a warmer climate? Also, major evolutionary transitions, the evolution, the evolution of birds from dinosaurs. Other things, changes how we get there, how we make new species. What kind of things happen to the body? How does evolution work on uh, species? And then, of course, extinction. When things, when things, when you have large extinction, when things go away, other organisms come in to take their place. We wouldn't be here if the dinosaurs hadn't been it 65 million years ago. So, just this is my, this is my last sta uh, statement here. So. Uh, and as you take, take, take this with you, think about this. So fossils are not just relics. They're not just things we put in the museum to go look at when we get bored. Um, they, are, they are a critical window into the, the, the past. All right? And it confronts us with how utterly strange and wonderful life has been and can be. And without, without studying fossils, we wouldn't know any of this. Um, as well as giving us information that helps us better understand where we're going and what kind of changes we may be able to expect. <coughs>